Hello friends, this is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN merch button click on that it'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that hey on the swag that i'm using it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear sports history network and my favorite podcaster the sports history network store shop there today this is basketball history 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I'm your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old-school basketball to a new-school audience, and today we bring you the story of a blue-collar player. His name was Dave DeBusher. One of the things that drew me to him was his hard-working approach to his basketball career. He was a guy that I could relate to, and his story is one that I really wanted to share with you. DeBusher is on the NBA 75 list as one of the greatest players ever to play in the NBA. He was a player who deserved to be recognized as a Hall of Famer. He was an eight-time All-Star, a six-time All-Defensive, he was on the All-Rookie Team, and a two-time champion. And if that is not enough, he also played four seasons of professional baseball. He was a basketball executive in both the ABA and the NBA. The guy was a basketball renaissance man. This is quite a resume for a regular blue-collar kid from Detroit, and this is why I was drawn to his story. My own parents were blue-collar workers. As I have mentioned in previous episodes, both of my parents are immigrants to the United States. My dad was a carpenter for a large part of his career, and my mom was a machine operator on an assembly line. They were both incredibly hard-working people, and I have a deep respect for those that work in the trades or do other similar type work. DeBusher was a kind of guy who knew how to put in an honest day's work, and it seems today that that is not as common as it used to be. So let us go back to the beginning of the story. DeBusher was born on October 16, 1940 in Detroit, Michigan. His father was a delivery driver. DeBusher grew up in a working class neighborhood in Detroit, and he saw his father do whatever it took to put food on the table and keep a roof over their head. That is a spirit that DeBusher took into his athletic career. His family was not rich, but they were willing to work for everything they had. This is the environment where DeBusher was raised. He saw this not only in his own family, but in his entire neighborhood. Like nearly every other person who becomes a professional athlete, DeBusher was bigger, faster, and stronger than all of the other kids in the neighborhood. He excelled at every sport he tried. He was coordinated and extremely athletic. He attended Austin Catholic Preparatory Academy, where he was the ace pitcher on the baseball team and the leading scorer on their brand new basketball team. The school did not have a basketball team before DeBusher enrolled. By his senior year, which was only the third year of the team's existence, he led them all the way to the Michigan State Championship. He was considered the best high school player in Detroit and probably the best player in all of Michigan. DeBusher was Detroit born and bred, and he had no intention of leaving home to go to college, so he accepted a scholarship to a local school. School, the University of Detroit. As I have mentioned in plenty of other episodes, back then freshmen were not allowed to play on the varsity under NCAA rules. He played out his freshman year on the freshman team, but then he joined the varsity starting with his sophomore year or second year. He led the team to two NIT appearances and one NCAA appearance, and back then both of those tournaments invited very few teams. Just getting into either tournament was a major accomplishment. Today, in the year 2022, the NCAA tournament invites 68 teams, while the NIT invites an additional 32 teams. That's 100 schools every year that play in one of those two tournaments. Back in the early 1960s, the number of schools that got to play in these tournaments was 37. 25 in the NCAA and 12 in the NIT. It was so much harder to make it into a postseason tournament in those days, and he put himself on the map as one of the best basketball players in the country. He was a sure pick in the 1962 NBA draft. But he was also an amazing baseball player. 
He was a star pitcher for the University of Detroit baseball team and received lots of attention from Major League Baseball. He led the team to three appearances in the NCAA Baseball Championship Tournament. As he graduated from college in the spring of 1962, he had a major decision to make. Should he pursue a career in the NBA or a career in Major League Baseball? This is Bo Jackson and Deion Sanders kind of stuff. It is so rare for an athlete to be so good at two different sports that he or she has contract offers from two different sports leagues. But this was the opportunity that DeBusher had in front of him. In the end, he decided to do both. He signed a contract for $160,000 with the Chicago White Sox. In 2022, that would be the equivalent of $1.5 million. That is very hard to turn down. At the same time, he was drafted by the Detroit Pistons with a territorial pick. Now let me take a moment to discuss what a territorial pick is. Back in the 1950s and the 1960s, the NBA had something called the territorial pick. This meant that any team could forego their regular first round pick and just take any college player that played their college basketball within 75 miles of the NBA team's arena. Teams were not required to use their territorial pick, it was simply an option in case a superstar player was coming from the same area as the NBA team. After all, taking a player in such a manner was the same as using their first round pick, so the Detroit Pistons could not pass up on a superstar playing right in their own backyard, so they used their territorial pick on DeBusher. Back then, the NBA figured that they could increase ticket sales if superstar college players play for nearby NBA teams, where they could play in front of, essentially, the same fan base. So, if a superstar player was coming out of a university in the New York area, let him play for the Knicks. If he was coming from a Boston school, well then let him play for the Celtics. And in this particular case, the player was coming from a school in Detroit. So let him play for the Pistons. Anyway, the Detroit Pistons took DeBusher as a no-brainer pick on their part. In the city of Detroit, Dave DeBusher was as famous as Henry Ford. They would not be disappointed. He was a really fantastic player. There were some concerns over his baseball contract, but there was very little overlap between the two sports. So DeBusher committed to playing both sports at the professional level. This is a good place to take a break and I'll be right back with Dave DeBusher's professional career and executive career after his retirement. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Welcome back to the show and let us continue with the story of Dave DeBusher. Right before the break, I mentioned that he had just graduated from the University of Detroit with a contract to play for the Detroit Pistons of the NBA and a contract to play baseball for the Chicago White Sox. He signed both contracts. In the summer of 1962, he made 12 appearances pitching 18 innings primarily in the role of closer. He had a 2.00 ERA a nice start for a rookie pitcher. When the summer was over, he reported to the Detroit Pistons to begin his first training camp as an NBA rookie. He played in every game averaging 13 points per game and 9 rebounds per game. Again, nice start for a rookie forward. As soon as his rookie year in the NBA was complete, he had to return immediately to the White Sox to pitch another summer of baseball. In the summer of 1963, he appeared in 24 games including 10 starts. His record was 3-4. and four. 
However, it started to become obvious that he did not have what it took to really excel as a professional baseball player. He did not have a reliable curveball and batters were starting to figure him out. Just like the previous summer, as soon as baseball was done, it was time to go back to basketball. In his second year with the Pistons, he had an injury plagued year and only played 15 games. Things did not get better for him in the summer of 1964 when he returned to the White Sox. They sent him down to the minors to work on that curveball, which he never really developed. But as DeBusher was starting his third year in the NBA, things got really interesting. He was having a great year and was averaging 17 points and 11 rebounds per game, but the team only had two victories in their first 11 games. That was not good at all. So the Pistons fired coach Charles Wolf and hired Dave DeBusher to be the new head coach. Here was a problem with that plan. While DeBusher was clearly the best player on the team, he was also one of the youngest at only 24 years old. In his retirement, he has said that he still did not know why they picked him, but he did accept the job and became the new head coach of the team. And it changed his relationship with the other players. It is one thing when you are one of the guys, a player just like everybody else, but now he was their boss and most of them were older than he was. He did the best he could, but even he admitted that he was not a great coach. He did not have control of the team and everybody did whatever they wanted. The team finished that season with only 31 wins, but then it was off to become what would be his final season of professional baseball. In the summer of 1965, he again pitched in the minors and realized that he did not have a real future as a Major League Baseball pitcher. So he hung up his glove and his spikes at the end of the baseball season and decided to concentrate on just being a basketball player. Well, and a basketball coach too. And that was a good thing because being the star player and being the head coach is a lot of responsibility, especially back in the day when there were no assistant coaches. Back then, the NBA budgets were much smaller. Every team had one head coach and no assistant coaches. In his first full season as the head coach, he coached himself to his very first All-Star game and established himself as a league superstar. However, the team finished with a record of 22 and 58 for the 1966 season. While he was doing everything he could to bring winning back basketball to Detroit, he could only do so much as a single player. The following season for the 1966-67 year, the team only improved to 30 victories. However, DeBusher made the All-Star game again. The one thing he proved that season was that being a full-time player, a part-time coach, and a part-time executive was too much to handle. The owners of the Pistons realized that too. With just eight games left in the season, he was relieved of his coaching and executive duties and returned to just being a basketball player. The new coach was Donnie Butcher. In the next season, with a full-time coach in place, the Pistons improved to 40-42 and 42 and made the playoffs. Things were on the up and up for the Pistons and DeBusher, who made the All-Star game for a third time. And then things started to fall apart again. For the 1968-69 season, the team slid back to just 32 victories. Coach Donnie Butcher was fired, and the Pistons decided to reboot the team by trading away their best player, Dave DeBusher. The team that wanted him was the New York Knicks. The Knicks were laughing all the way to the playoffs. In other words, they had two players who were more concerned with their own statistics than with victories. The Knicks convinced the Pistons to take both of these players in exchange for Dave DeBusher. The players that the Pistons took on were Walt Bellamy and Butch Comives. That single trade allowed Willis Reed to slide back to his natural position of center once Bellamy was gone. It also allowed Walt Frazier to take over the point guard duties from Comives. DeBusher with his blue collar attitude was everything that the Knicks were missing. As a power forward, he could shoot, block shots, rebound, set screens, dive for loose balls, and always gave 100% effort while doing it. The Knicks loved having another all-star in the locker room with them, and it did not hurt that he got along really well with the rest of the players. Despite his immense success as a professional athlete, he was always a regular guy and never understood the fuss that people made when meeting him. Now, the story of his trade to the Knicks is actually quite unique. He played his last game for the Pistons on December 18, 1968, and it was a home game for the Pistons, and DeBusher scored 19 points against the San Diego Rockets. He was a New York Knick the next day. His first game as a Knick was going to be in Detroit. The whole game was odd for the Pistons and the Pistons fans. Here was DeBusher who had just scored 19 points for the Pistons two nights earlier and now just 48 hours later he was a Nick 
Friends and family came out to see him play in Detroit for his first game with the Knicks, and he played like he had been on the Knicks for years. He scored 21 points and pulled down 15 rebounds. The Knicks won by a score of 135 to 87. That is a 48 point victory. The Knicks went on to win 16 of their next 17 games with DeBusher in the lineup. He was a secret ingredient that the Knicks had been looking for. DeBusher was willing to do all of the little things that make any team a championship contender. With the Knicks, he would win the championship in 1970 and 1973, and DeBusher would go on to play five more All-Star games as a Nick. He retired from the game at the end of the 1973-74 season, which caught some by surprise because he was an All-Star that year, meaning he was still playing at a very high level level, but that is something that I have mentioned previously on this show, is that the medical treatment and the sports medicine was not what it is today. Most players began to see a real decline in their play at the age of 30. A 10-year career was great, and DeBusher already had 12 years in the NBA. Upon his retirement, he was hired by the New York Nets, then of the ABA, as a front office executive. The move also gave him a first-hand look at the other league that was trying to challenge the NBA. After just one year on the job with the Nets, he was hired to become the commissioner of the entire ABA. He was only 35 years old and was now the commissioner of the rival league. At the end of his only year as commissioner, he helped to negotiate the merger between the ABA and the NBA. If he had not been there to help negotiate that merger, it is possible that the ABA might have gone completely out of business. They were in some real financial straits. As the merger was completed, he was out of a job because there was no room for two commissioners and the NBA already had one in Larry O'Brien and he would be the leader of the new merged organization. After a few years, DeBersher was hired as the general manager of the New York Knicks, his old team. The most memorable move that he made as the general manager came in 1985. The Knicks held the first pick in the draft and it fell to DeBersher to make the decision on who to select. Here is a short list of some of the players that were available in that draft. Chris Mullen, Carl Malone, and Joe Dumars, all Hall of Famers. But the Knicks had made their decision very early. They knew that they were going to go with Patrick Ewing from Georgetown University. And he continued to work for the Knicks for years. He contributed so much to basketball as a player, as an executive, and as a coach, even if he was not that great of a coach. Dave DeBusher was just a regular blue collar kid who happened to grow up to be six foot six or 198 centimeters and was extremely athletic. When his family talks about him, they say that he was just a normal guy. He was not arrogant or entitled. He was generous and he looked out for other people. He was always about the team first. Now that's the kind of a guy that I would not mind having a conversation with. Sadly, he passed away in 2003 from a heart attack while walking down the street in Manhattan. I just want to salute Dave DeBusher on a career well done and a life well done. He was truly one of the greats of the league and he never forgot how to treat people the right way. DeBusher deserved to be inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1983. He was truly that good. Well, that is it for today. That is a story of Dave DeBusher. Join us next time when we share the story of the 1961 college basketball betting scandal. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts and check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. It was just another ordinary day in the offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items, thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website. 
where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so Retro it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of Row 1 Sports Memorabilia Arts and Prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row 1 catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act A for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, Sports Writer, coming soon. Oh,